So thank you everyone for joining us for what is now our 22nd Inspiration Exchange session. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Fergus Imri and I'm a postdoc in the Van der Schaal lab. I'm delighted um, to be hosting today's session, which is on Autoprognosis 2.0, which is our lab's uh, latest tool for clinical modeling. Um, we'll introduce this a little bit more later, but before I have a couple of announcements um, that uh, to make. The first is that we that the Van der Schaal Lab is continuing to recruit for new PhD students. Um, we've had a lot of applications already, and we're still in the process of going through those. So if you have already applied, um, we are still in the process of reviewing applications. But if you've not done so already, we do encourage you um, to do so if you're interested in joining us. And you can apply to our lab via the Van der Schaal Lab website. And if you click the Join Us form and complete the short form there, um, that is the best way to get in touch with us and apply. Secondly, uh, next week, uh, NeurIPS, one of probably the, the largest machine learning conference is taking place. Um, a lot of members from our lab will be there presenting various papers, workshop and workshop papers. We would love um, if you would come and chat to us and engage with us on our work and also to get to hear about you and your work a bit more at the conference. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you'll be in New Orleans next week. Without further ado, let me get back to today's session. And as always, the ongoing aim of Inspiration Exchange is to share and explore the breadth of topics in machine learning for healthcare and generate ideas for future research. As I mentioned earlier, the topic of today's session is autoprognosis 2.0. After my short introduction, Mahela um, is going to motivate and discuss a bit of the origins of this autoprognosis project. I'm then going to play a demonstration of autoprognosis and offer, offer some insight into, into our use of it within our lab. It's then going to be a short presentation by Dr. Thomas Callender, who is a Wellcome Trust uh, clinical training fellow, who will give a short talk about how he has used autoprognosis already. And then we will go into our roundtable discussion with industry and clinical leaders, who I'll introduce more formally later in the session. We'll then open up to a Q&A session. And so if and please ask about any of the areas that we've talked about today, putting questions to any of our speakers or panelists. And if you have a question, please post your questions in the Inspiration Exchange Slack channel. Um, the, you should find the Slack link in the latest email sent out, but Tennyson will also put it in the chat now for you to join if you've not done so already. So without further ado, let me pass over to Mahela for her introduction to autoprognosis too. Welcome to our um, inspiration exchange. Today, I'm really quite excited because we are going to present to you a tool that I think is both robust as well as useful and is aimed at democratizing diagnostic and prognostic modeling in healthcare. Um, Often when I think about what machine learning can do in healthcare, I think about a diversity of stakeholders and a, vari a variety of uses of machine learning. Providing analytics for empowering clinicians in hospitals, clinics, and their offices. Providing personalized recommendations for patients to improve their health. Drug discovery, that can empower both clinical research and development, but also analytics to empower hospital administrators and the entire healthcare ecosystem, which appeared very important during the pandemic. Also machine learning can be used for providing recommendations in terms of clinical practice guidelines, such as risk scores for healthcare bodies, including the NHS here in the UK, as well as public health analysis and public policy recommendations in the entire healthcare ecosystem. But how to democratize machine learning to enable all these very diverse um, healthcare stakeholders to use machine learning successfully in their environments? There are numerous challenges associated with that. For instance, for instance, we all know that there are numerous machine learning models available and their performance can drastically vary depending on the data set, but also the tasks that we want to perform. 
Also, the machine learning models often require state-of-the-art knowledge to train effectively because they may have numerous hyperparameters and often they don't work in isolation. Also, machine learning models may need to be repeatedly updated as more data and more variables are collected. So it could be that a particular new biomarker is collected for a particular disease or the disease may be changing over time because patients may become more, uh, more may have multiple comorbidities or potentially they may um, give up smoking. Also, um, machine learning needs to be transparent and easy to debug and understand for the various stakeholders. So we cannot have just machine learning models that have high quality and high accuracy, but also they need to be interpretable and trustworthy. Also, we, the machine learning community, and uh, I'm joined here by numerous people from the machine learning community, we like to develop new models over all the time. Hence, how can we create an ecosystem where we can put these new models and let them uh, be used by practitioners in an easy way? And in that context, reproducible machine learning results and analytics are essential, both to be able to publish uh, machine learning papers in healthcare where the benchmarks are robust and reproducible, but also to enable um, new types of ecosystems to use new cutting edge machine learning models that you may develop. Finally, um, I think that an important challenge in healthcare is to build risk scores that are free and that do not require um, monetization such that everybody can take good use of these particular tools to improve health care of the populations throughout the world. So how to address these numerous challenges? We have been thinking about this problem for many years, and we feel that the best way to think about that is to let the machine learning model itself do the crafting of such machine learning models. And for that, we need to rely on automated and interpretable machine learning. This is a very vibrant area of research. As a matter of fact, earlier this summer, together with a few other collaborators um, throughout the world, we have had the first, the world's first automated machine learning conference that took place in July. And we hope that this will continue. Our own work in the lab focuses on a particular branch of automated machine learning, machine learning for healthcare. And this is quite distinct than other work that happens in machine learning, automated machine learning. If you are interested to learn more about the specific strand of automated machine learning in healthcare, I invite you to take a look at this research pillar. And in fact, our journey in automated machine learning for healthcare started quite a few years back with the first version of autoprognosis, which is a tool for crafting clinical scores. It takes clinical data and it builds pipelines of imputation, feature processing, classification, and calibration. These pipelines are not only issuing predictions by themselves, but often they are constructing ensembles of multiple pipelines that are weighted together to issue this particular prediction. It also issues explanations. And indeed, autoprognosis was used over the last five years in a variety of settings, from cystic fibrosis to cardiovascular disease, from prostate cancer to breast cancer. But what is interesting, it was not only used for predicting disease in a particular population or a predicting response to treatment in a population that has already the disease, for instance, in the case of breast cancer, but it was also used for managing resources. As a matter of fact, early in the pandemic, together with NHS Digital, we joined forces to use autoprognosis to determine um, resources in the hospitals that were overwhelmed within the United Kingdom. So autoprognosis was used to determine to, and forecast upcoming demand for intensive care beds and ventilators to treat patients with COVID-19. So what you can see is that a tool like autoprognosis can be used not only for predicting um, risk of disease, 
or for uh, determining prognostic scores after a patient has a particular disease, but also to predict other things that could be useful within the healthcare ecosystem, either in the pharmaceutical industry or um, more generally in healthcare systems. But autoprognosis, the original version of autoprognosis required quite a lot of improvements. And what we have done uh, and we would like to present to you today is autoprognosis 2.0, which is a tool that we have built together with Fergus Bogdan, who is a machine learning engineer in our lab and our clinical collaborator, Professor Owen McKinney. Um, you can read the paper as well as see the software at the website dedicated to autoprognosis, and Fergus will tell you more about that. What I would like to highlight to you, if you have seen autoprognosis, the original version of it, is that autoprognosis 2.0 goes way beyond that. And it does so in a few important ways. First, unlike autoprognosis 1.0, Autoprognosis 2.0 does not only classification, it does also survivor analysis, time to event analysis, which is very important in healthcare, where we are not interested only to predict disease or a particular outcome of interest within a certain time horizon, but we would like to have entire time to event curves to be able to predict um, events of interest. Also, we have a much larger number of algorithms and incorporated within this particular ecosystem, inclusively state-of-the-art technology in imputation. But another important characteristic of autoprognosis 2.0 is the fact that we have many more interpretability modules, a variety of such interpretability modules, which enable us to engage with stakeholders by providing interpretations of all different kinds associated with these predictions. So we believe that autoprognosis 2.0 can democratize machine learning for anyone interested in developing risk scores. And it is an open source, easy to use, state-of-the-art interpretable machine learning package. Um, Fergus will tell you more about how to use this package both in an expert and non-expert environment. So I really hope that all of you are going to engage with this tool and help us build it into a useful and pertinent tool to empower the healthcare professionals. Finally, yesterday we have our sister engagement session, which is dedicated to clinicians called Revolutionizing Healthcare. And the session was dedicated to autoprognosis 2.0. If you are interested in this, please um, keep an eye on our Revolutionizing Healthcare YouTube channel, um, the part of our Van der Schaar Lab YouTube channel dedicated to Revolutionizing Healthcare to see that session and see what the clinicians had to say about this. Thank you very much. We have, like I, I we pre-recorded a demonstration demonstrating how we can use ultra prognosis um, in a technical way with code. So, my talk is going to fit into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to play this, this short video. Then in the second part, I'm going to discuss an illustrative application of autoprognosis 2. I'm delighted to introduce autoprognosis 2.0, democratizing diagnostic and prognostic modeling in healthcare with automated machine learning. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate autoprognosis 2.0 and how it can be used. To start with, I'm going to explain what Autoprognosis 2 is, and it's our lab's latest tool for clinical modeling, able to handle classification, regression, and time to event or survival analysis. The capabilities of Autoprognosis can be grouped into two main components. First, using automated machine learning, Autoprognosis imputes missing data and optimizes machine learning pipelines, determining not only which models are most appropriate for a given data set, but also tuning hyperparameters. Autoprognosis then constructs a final predictive model as an ensemble of the best performing pipelines. Crucially, autoprognosis does more than just develop optimized models, but also allows investigation of the derived models and allows models to be readily shared in an accessible format. Now let's get into the demonstration of autoprognosis 2. Now for the demonstration. For this demonstration, we're going to follow a tutorial that is provided in the GitHub repo, should you want to try it out yourself. We're going to begin by installing autoprognosis. You can do this locally on a server of your choice, 
or alternatively, as I'm going to do today, demonstrate the use of autoprognosis online using Google Colab. Once autoprognosis is installed, we'll begin by importing some necessary packages and functions that we'll use later. Next, we're going to load in our data set. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to use the Breast Cancer Wisconsin data set from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Um, however, autoprognosis can handle any data set that you want that can be imported as a pandas data frame. And this includes data that has been pre-processed using R or Starter or another statistical um, program. Now that our data is loaded, we can see that this data set consists of 569 examples and 30 features which describe the cell images of the breast cancer data sets um, that we're using. We're now going to move on and run a study with autoprognosis. So there are a number of possible classification algorithms in autoprognosis, 23 in total, and you can see them listed here. But for the purposes of today's study, we're only going to use four different classification algorithms, logistic regression, perceptron, XGBoost, and decision trees. In addition, while autoprognosis can perform imputation, the data set we've chosen is complete, so imputation is not necessary. Let us now run our study. Now that our study's been completed, let's check out what it's found. So let's load in the optimal pipeline. And, and as we can see, our optimal pipeline is a, is a weighted combination of three of the models, consisting of around 18% the logistic regression model, 36% the perceptron, and 45% XGBoost. Now let's use autoprognosis to evaluate our performance. As you can see, on this data set, autoprognosis achieved very strong performance with an area under the receiver operating curve exceeding 0.99. Crucially though, autoprognosis enables us to do more than just develop computational pipelines, but also to understand and debug these models. Here, I'm gonna use the kernel SHAP explainer in order to understand the most important predictive features of this model. We can now see what were the most important features according to the kernel SHAP explainer for, for our predictor de derived with autoprognosis. We can see the mean perimeter feature is deemed the most important feature according to kernel SHAP. However, this isn't the only explainability method available. For example, we can also understand um, feature importance using the effect size. And we can see here that there are some similar features ranked the most important, but they're not quite identical, illustrating the difference um, in results between different explainers. Finally, in this tutorial, I'd like to show how autoprognosis can be used to assess the value of information. Often in clinical practice, models should use as few features as possible. And here we use the, the effect size explainer to select different subsets of features and assess the performance of our pipeline using only those features. But interestingly, we can see when only using 25 of the 30 features, actually the performance is the same, if not slightly better than using all the features. As, this, as the risk effect size increases, we naturally select fewer features, but with just 16 of the total 30 features, or the performance is identical um, to the performance using all of the features. As we use fewer and fewer features, we can see naturally that the performance drops off slightly, but even using just nine features, we still exhibit a very strong performance. This now concludes the tutorial part of this video, but if you want to, if you want to find out more, there's several helpful resources that I can point you to that are included in the notebook. To briefly highlight these resources. First, we've, we've produced a dedicated website for Autoprognosis 2.0, which acts as a centralized hub for all things autoprognosis. Secondly, you can find all code for autoprognosis on GitHub, where we've included a number of tutorials in addition to the one um, I've demonstrated today. And finally, if you'd like to read more about autoprognosis 2 and how our framework works, including an illustrative example using UK Biobank, check out our paper.
Well, hopefully that was a, an interesting introduction sort of prognosis and how you would actually use it um, as a user. Now, obviously, in this example, this was just a toy. This was just a, almost a toy data set and the performance was almost unbelievably high. However, we've also applied auto prognosis in an illustrative application for diabetes risk prediction. And to do so, we use the UK Biobank data set. UK Biobank consists of over half a million volunteers from the UK who are enrolled between ages of 40 and 69. And enrollment took place across 22 centers across the entirety of the UK over a four year period from 2006 to 2010. And follow ups expected to continue for the next 30 years which means that now for people that were enrolled, we've got between about 12 and 15 years of, of potential follow-up data. And the task we wanted to apply autoprognosis to was to predict the risk of developing diabetes. And primarily we were looking within a 10 year horizon, but as Mahela mentioned, autoprognosis too, one of the key improvements is that it can now perform survival analysis. And so this was, this was the formulation um, of the problem that we set up. Naturally, um, we compared autoprognosis to, to existing um, models, existing risk source for predicting the risk of diabetes, such as the American Diabetes Association's risk score, FinRisk, Diabetes UK, and perhaps the most well-known, the, um, the kind of Q diabetes model, which consists of three different models with slightly different variables. We also considered retraining Cox proportional hazard models using the same features as those risk scores um, on the same derivation cohort used to train autoprognosis. And we found that autoprognosis 2.0 um, greatly improved the ability to um, predict someone's risk of diabetes compared to these existing models. Crucially, and as I think you'll hear more about later in the session, it's not just about greater predictive performance um, at all costs and potentially using all features. And actually one key factor in clinical practice is how can you um, use the, the smallest amount of information or the fewest number of features for the greatest predictive benefit? And with autoprognosis, we showed that just using eight features, we outperformed the best performing existing risk score, which is the Q Diabetes Model C, that use 17 features, and that performance um, continues to greatly improve until, until between 30 and 40 features, at which point it begins to, it begins to plateau as more features are added up to the total about 100 features we used um, to explore in our study. In addition, as mentioned, there are many ways of interpreting um, such models, which is a key, which is like a key requirement um, for clinicians, regulators and patients alike. And you can see on the left an example of the glo of global feature importance using the SHAP explainer, which highlights that the HbA1c, which is a measure of um, blood glucose over the last um, over the last uh, several months, on average, as the most important feature for diabetes. And on the right, we have looked at um, the different risk factors for different sub cohorts. Um, well, we've defined the sub cohort by those in the top fifty percent of HbA1c measurements and those in the bottom fifty percent. And you can see, and you can see highlighted in the blue, actually the different the differences in features. Uh, that are important for the model between those two cohorts. Finally, one of the nice things that you can do with autoprognosis too is automatically produce clinical demonstrators um, without having to write any um, front-end website, like additional code to produce, to produce these. And this is an example from our diabetes study um, for UK Biobank, where a clinician can go in and and either enter the features for a particular patient or look to debug our model by testing out how the predicted risk would change as one of the individual features changes. So with that, I'd now like to um, introduce and pass over to uh, Dr. Thomas Callender, who will tell us a little bit about his experiences using autoprognosis too so far. Great, thank you very much, Fergus. So I'm going to quickly give you an example from uh, the perspective of a clinical academic. Um, so I'm a public health doctor and I work at uh, University College London and my interest is really in prediction and prevention at a population scale. So this covers some work we did in lung cancer. Um, and why we did it is that lung cancer survival is incredibly poor. Over the last 40 years or so, it's 
not really changed very much. And this is UK data of five year net survival. And the reason behind this is that almost all lung cancers are picked up at a very late stage. So stage three or four would be considered advanced incurable. But screening could reduce lung cancer deaths by about 20% amongst those screened. And it's that key bit there of how do we find those people who will benefit from screening and therefore should go into the screening program. So what we did is we used uh, UK Biobank data again, and we mixed this with a randomized trial from the US, which was a higher risk cohort. And then we further validated it in a separate uh, US cohort. Um, and what we were really interested in is trying to develop a model that was UK specific, but also could be generalizable. And one of the first things that we did when we started to debug everything was to find that actually almost all of the predictions were determined by three factors. And so we then thought, okay, well, if we just apply the model using these factors, what would happen? And in reality, we found that those three variables within uh, this format, where these are the the pre-processing steps and the algorithms and then their eventual pipeline weights, we found that those three variables within this machine learning ensemble was equivalent or so it exceeded parity of several of the models that are currently in use and was equivalent to the best ones. And all of these have over 10 plus predictors. And this is quite important as I'll come on to in a second. But when highlighting using autoprognosis, one of the reasons why I was interested in this was because almost all models in, in lung cancer just use logistic regression or cost proportional hazards. So we thought maybe there would be uh, an additional boost. But the other thing was that actually in the process of doing it, when we were actually building the models, often I'd find that actually one algorithm was enough that even if you set the software such that it was supposed to build an ensemble of four or more, uh, if in the case one was better than all of them, that is what came out. So from a clinical perspective, this was incredibly useful because you knew what you were building was actually adding value. Understanding the model, as Fergus has explained, is incredibly important. And for us, this also allowed us to debug it and show, for example, here that there are these cutoff points with smoking duration that have been seen in other causal studies and were important to make it seem, well, to, to ensure that we knew that the, the model was actually predicting the right stuff. But why is this important? Well, with this kind of model, we could really change how we design a lung cancer screening program. So this is what we currently do in the UK. We, we trawl GP records to find people who are potentially eligible based on their age and smoking status. We then send them all letters asking them to call a screening center. And then those who do call, we assess their individual risk using two different risk models, which is 19 variables and it takes about 10 minutes per person. And then those people who are over risk threshold get then further invited for screening. But this has all kinds of problems from a first bit where smoking status is notoriously unreliable within electronic health records to the fact that by sending them letters, we, we're probably going to get people who are more motivated about their health, which probably means that the people who really need it are not going to get involved. And then we have to do this over the phone, which means we have to have call centers filled with people to do it. And if you think about population scale prediction, that just becomes too complex when you've got multiple diseases. But when you can move from what we're currently using, which is 19 plus variables to what we have now produced with autoprognosis, you could simply do this based on GP records and then direct somebody to a website to be able to fit in and check some of the other bits of information, completely bypassing the entire call center. You could simply do this with your GP or just another allied healthcare professional. It doesn't actually need to be a doctor to do this. And so routine risk assessment in primary care could be realistic. Or in the future, you could entirely automate the risk assessment behind the scenes so that the right people were flagged and sent letters. And as we move to predictive prevention, this kind of personalization, but also the simplification and the power that machine learning may be able to provide in that is something that's very valuable. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Tom. That was that was fantastic. And it was great, great to hear so early from a clinician um, that's, used, that's using our tool. So I'm delighted to welcome our three guests today. The first is Dr. Aditya Nori, who is the general manager in healthcare at Microsoft Health Futures. I'm also delighted to welcome um, Professor Owen McKinney, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Cambridge and was one of our co-developers co and co-authors of Autoprognosis 2. And finally, um, to welcome Dr. Thomas Callender, who you've just heard from. Um, 
who is a Wellcome Trust Clinical Training Fellow and an Academic Researcher at UCL. The panel discussion today will be chaired by Mihaela. So Mihaela, why don't I turn over to you to ask the first question? Thank you very much, Aditya, Ern, and Tom for joining us. And Aditya, the first question is for you. What do you think are the next steps for automated machine learning? And a follow-up question is, autoprognosis consists of several different pieces. Which piece do you think is the most valuable and important? And which have the most opportunities from a machine learning perspective? Thanks, Mihela. Uh, first, uh, uh, thank you, Mihela, for inviting me here. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And also thanks uh, for sharing your work, uh, Fergus and Tom, really fantastic stuff. Uh, I also loved Fergus's demo and it was interesting to see the real world use case from Tom and really the exciting potential for, for improved uh, screening programs. So Mihela, let me try to answer your question. So as you know, and as many of you know, AutoML, there's been a you know, natural evolution of the, the problems that the research community has focused on. Originally, AutoML was used to learn hyperparameters of, of really small models, and, and next, the focus shifted to the optimization of end-to-end -end machine learning and data science uh, pipelines consisting of multiple steps. And at some point, a core part of AutoML, given the deep learning wave, shifted to neural architecture search for automatically tuning neural networks. So moving forward, I, I think there are two natural steps. Uh, first is, I think it's important for the research to pivot from the optimization of uh, machine learning models or pipelines to the optimization of end-to-end -end machine learning systems, you know, which may include multiple models and pipelines, multiple data streams, user interfaces, et cetera. You know, uh, this is crucial, I think, as it is unclear uh, you know, to me at least that a model that is optimal with respect to a local metric will uh, effectively improve the overall system into which it is deployed into. And uh, these are common issues, of course, that many of us are working on, and, and some of them involve propagation of errors, incorrect downstream metrics that are chosen as a matter of convenience, uh, you know, communication between models, et cetera. Uh, the second direction has to do with metrics that are used to define the best model and pipeline. Traditionally, the AutoML community has focused on accuracy, but it is becoming increasingly evident that other metrics beyond accuracy also need to be considered. Uh, it would be fantastic if AutoML is able to offer approaches that allow users to choose the balance of accuracy with other metrics related to privacy, robustness, fairness, utility, et cetera. And needless to say, there are some efforts in this direction, but I think the field is still dominated by accuracy-based uh, outcomes. Moving, sorry, Mihela, you're on mute. No, I just wanted to say I completely echo your vision. I think that based on my discussions with clinicians, it seems that we should much more look also at least at precision recall yes. in addition to more area under receiver operating curve since the false alarms of these methods seem to be annoying many. So I think that that's a great point. Even within the realm of accuracy, I think we could do more. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, your group and many others are actually doing a lot of this stuff already. Um, to your second question about uh, your lab's work on auto prognosis. Yeah, thanks again for presenting the vision. I think it's very exciting to de develop these frameworks to optimize uh, machine learning pipelines for clinical applications, in particular, you know, disease prognosis. Um, my understanding is that uh, the framework uh, automatically selects the best methods for performing things like data imputation, dimensionality reduction, prediction, and calibration for a given problem. I think all of these steps are super important, but I think what's exciting is you know, the joint optimization of all these components, which makes it particularly interesting from a machine learning perspective. And of course, you know, as you already know, there are a few opportunities that could be embedded within an auto prognosis type of framework and some directions worth considering. Uh, and knowing Mihela and your lab, I'm sure all of you are working on these things already, but I will say it nevertheless. So, so one problem, of course, is continual learning. So 
it feels like at least whatever I read up, you know, autoprognosis at this point is like a static procedure and it doesn't take into account as yet that data in healthcare is continuously evolving and this may affect what our best modeling choices are. And in these cases, the question is, do we need to run the optimization, optimization every time you know, that uh, when we receive a new piece of evidence or can we update the previous parameters? If so, how should this be done? This seems in, important, of course, not obvious to me, but at least you know, uh, on how we can do this effectively. Thank you so much, Aditya. As a matter of fact, a brilliant former student, Yao Zhang, developed a method called lifelong uh, Bayesian optimization. It's not part of the package, but I think you gave us a new challenge to, to, to revamp that method and maybe build it in. So thank you. Wonderful to hear. Um, <laughs> the second thought which comes to mind is, you know, uh, interactions across components of the pipeline. So your framework uses a Gaussian process with additive kernels that models separately each component of the pipeline. Uh, and this is of course done to make the optimization of the hyperparameters easier, but there could be potential issues with this if there are interac interactions between elements of the pipeline. So how do we kind of incorporate this in the current approach while maintaining tractability? And also, as I mentioned before, evaluating the impact of the pipeline choices for multiple metrics feels like a sensible direction to pursue rather than using accuracy only. And the current approach finds the pipeline that provides the best accuracy. So what if, for instance, we want to maximize accuracy given a specific level of differential privacy in the learning process? And finally, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done on optimization for data invariance, as you know, Robust predictions are key in healthcare, and these require learning causal invariants that retain the ability of the model to make product predictions across multiple and diverse cohorts. How do we embed these properties in autoprognosis? That's all I have. Big homework, big homework. We accept the challenge. Thank you so much. Um, let us go to the next question. Um, and this is for Ern and Tom. What excites you about tools like autoprognosis? And um, of course, <laughs> we have just released autoprognosis 2.0 and Aditya gave us already a few insights on what we should be working on. But from your perspective, from the clinical perspective, what do you think that autoprognosis 3.0 should look like? And what capabilities would you like us, the machine learning community to work on? to augment these tools and make them more useful for you, the clinical community. Thanks, Mihaela. Um, it's, it's, always, it's always exciting to look ahead to the next step before you've even had a proper chance to play with this one. It's almost like sort of trying to get your next Christmas list together before you've had this Christmas. Um, I was just thinking, um, um, we, we talked recently about how, what else can be done by the machine learning community to make clinicians use this to actually get it into practice and you're sort of stripping out a lot of the technical expertise that's required to engage with machine learning which i think is a huge step in the right direction i wonder if it would be feasible in auto prognosis 3 to build in some form of sensitivity to noise because we know that for example some of the features that are retained and incorporated in predictive models can be great and they can allow very accurate predictions to be made in a research discovery study context. But once we ship that model out into being used in a cold wet Wednesday in the middle of nowhere in a small hospital, it breaks down and doesn't work because of the error incorporated in the measurement. So I think understanding which variables can, can cope with extra noise might just make it easier. Again, it's, it's moving some of the burden onto the machine learner's shoulders to try and uh, make the approach easier for clinicians to get over the hurdles that we put in, in, in the way. Sorry to jump. Um, it's amazing that you say that because what we plan to do in the next inspiration exchange is to discuss this data centric agenda and what can machine learning do to really not only deal with analytics, but with the quality of the data, inclusively noise, bias, and so on. So so if, you are, if anyone on this particular session is interested in that, come and join us next time where we plan to brainstorm about this particular problem of 
errors, noise, biases, and the machine learning data centric agenda. Sounds perfect timing, but I think that could be important because that would help get across that that get that gap and get things into use. I guess if I'm allowed one other feature, feature selection is challenging, right? And an and iterative replacement of individual features can allow us to try and understand the value of any one piece of information, but trying to identify uh, an optimal model amongst a much larger feature set can be hugely informative from an interpretation perspective if I really don't know what I should be measuring here. And yet, as is the case with many discovery studies in biomedicine now, we have the technological capacity to measure tens of thousands of features. We've no idea which ones are, should, would be informative. If there's, and I know there already are, already are some dimensionality reduction methods incorporated into order prognosis too, but um, being able to support larger feature selection approaches would, I, I don't know if that's already- One way, which we do it already, and, and I'll, I'll pass it to Fergus to say more things. So already some form, I'm not saying the best way necessarily, but one way to do that is already incorporated in auto prognosis 2.0. And one could do the following, could train machine learning models and then use methods like in VASE that are post hoc to identify what features were important for individuals or classes of individuals. So first version of this is already now possible that would allow practitioners to determine what values, what, what, what information is, has been deemed as valuable by the pipeline. But I guess your challenge is to see if we could do even better, but at least I'd invite people to play with in ways as a post hoc tool to do that. That, that sort of moves towards almost uh, subclass recognition in a, in a generative sense where you're, you're identifying subgroups of individuals you didn't know were there. And I know tools like Simplex can facilitate that as well. So I guess that's an, an additional bolt-on uh, facility that would be useful. Should I add something? Thanks, if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, sure. Um, uh, coming back to your original point, the I think the thing, there are two really big things that excite me about uh, autoprognosis. One being that I, I really do think that automation is important, whether or not you're an expert or a non-expert, to be able to improve the quality of uh, clinical risk prediction models. There are a lot of models that are built, especially using machine learning, and um, they're often done in a really poor manner. And it's kind of unsurprising given the number of algorithms that are out there, knowing what kind of hyperparameters to use is something that is beyond most clinicians, certainly, um, if they even know what a hyperparameter is. And the, the brilliance of that is that it can democratize access to some of these things in places where we'll never be able to have enough biostatisticians or machine learning engineers to be able to do it by themselves. And so fundamentally it can free us free time to do other things to answer better questions new insights etc but the other thing that i think is really important is that it's a kind of new shift in the paradigm in in the clinical risk prediction world we use post hoc checklists to be able to drive up quality and it it, uh, it doesn't really work um because it's code that matters but you don't always have to share the code and even if you do have to share the code it's almost always unreadable and so What's useful about a tool like autoprognosis is that it is a way of ensuring that you've got a benchmark for a particular question such that you know that if somebody's doing something very fancy on top of it, well, it's it may well be better, but you know where you, you know what a good model should look like. And by moving in that direction where we can encode good practice, I think we are going to get better models and therefore safer models, because this is the kind of fundamental pillar of preventive medicine, um, personalized medicine. But in terms of the future i mean there's so many different things that we can talk about um i think one of the things there's two things from a from a one slightly more boring than the other but the other perhaps is is more um of a concept rather than a specific ask and it's a human-centered automation so the model the the process is very good but a little bit more like 
GitHub Copilot or something like that, it, clinicians don't usually know how to program very well. And so the ability to, to ask questions in a human format, but also to specify a lot of things in advance, because there are still a lot of skeptics around some of these technologies. So if you can specify what interactions you might want to play with, what kind of things that they can test, then some people will find that maybe the Cox model that you're comparing against isn't just a cheat. It's not just too oversimplistic. It's not what we would have done otherwise. And I think that making it more readable to the average person that designed in a way that that clinicians think is probably going to be a helpful way forward. Yeah. So Aditya, do you think autoprognosis could be valuable within Microsoft for research in healthcare? And are there any recent developments in machine learning that you think are potentially transformational in healthcare? And maybe if I may add, knowing that you have done personally a tremendous amount of work on imaging as well, machine learning for imaging, do you think we can combine all these type of technologies together to really empower clinicians? Yeah, thanks, Mihela. Uh, short answer is yes, of course. You know, uh, I'm 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 super delighted that your your group is tackling several hard problems in this space with potential for real world impact. Um, but I think it would be great, as you know, to take into account nuances of healthcare when automating these machine learning pipelines, for example, when, when building a model for healthcare, <clears throat> not all available variables are equally relevant for modeling and they should be reflected in the imputation process as well. As an example, which is a little different from your prognosis example, is the randomized controlled trial simulation example for RCT simulation, imputation errors and variables that are part of the eligibility criteria severely influence which patients to involve and consequently uh, which data are used for modeling. And these errors are more critical than, um, than imputation errors in, in model covariates because the latter can be, you know, averaged out and corrected by the model, uh, but the former may leave some critical points uh, behind. So the question is, how can you work the leverage for better data imputation specific to these kinds of healthcare scenarios? And, and this is just an example. I do not know the answer, of course. And just trying to make a point that methods that work well in the general domain uh, may need to be revisited so that they are aligned with the goals that we have in healthcare delivery and eventually improving patient experiences and outcomes. Uh, another application, and it's related to the imaging stuff that you just mentioned, is to enable true scale out across multiple providers, which is what I find to be really excited about the auto prognosis work. So in particular, if one was to build, let's say, an imaging kind of end to end application for a particular hospital to you know, accelerate you know, cancer radiotherapy workflows, for argument's sake, it would be invaluable to use auto prognosis type of frameworks to automatically fine tune the parameters of the bespoke models that we build for a particular hospital so that it can be deployed across you know, multiple hospitals. Um, with respect to your second question about recent exciting developments in, in machine learning, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a great time to work in AI. And, and there's a huge opportunity for AI to transform healthcare. You know, that's that's specifically what gets me up in the morning, very excited about life. And the top thing that comes to mind, everyone's mind these days is the fantastic progress we have seen with you know, large uh, language models, more popularly known as foundation models. It would indeed be exciting to leverage these models to structure EHRs, clinical reports, as well as the wealth of scientific and medical knowledge in biomedical literature, and of course, incorporate multiple modalities, including you know, genetic information for the purpose of improving patient safety outcomes and experiences. I also find the new developments in um, causal methods to be exciting, specifically the combination of observational and experimental data to reduce the burden that is placed on prospective studies, including the prediction of long-term outcomes for patients. Um, I think there's there's huge excitement around this potential, but I think this excitement must also must also be tempered by the knowledge that despite decades of advances, there remains a disappointing lack of AI adoption in the healthcare system. So I think it's imperative that we do not fumble this opportunity and that we attend to both machine learning advances, but also to its widespread spread adoption and delivery in healthcare systems. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Fergus, I guess now we can ask, uh, we can answer questions from the audience. Yes, definitely. We're we're obviously running a little tight on time, but I think we've got time to take a couple of a couple of questions from the audience, and then we'll try and answer as many additional questions as we can that are posted in the Slack after the session. So the first question I'd like to take is: I think um, Ali um, Sefi, you had a couple of questions. Maybe you could just ask ask one of them, um, so we can get like online, and then we'll answer the other offline. Sure. Thank you so much, Hi, everyone. So my main question was that, uh, are you providing users with the counterfactual results or not? I mean, I noticed that you're supporting some of the explainers like the Lime and kernel chap, but, but uh, I couldn't see the counterfactual explanations. Uh, I believe that would be really interesting from the clinical use case that you see uh, what is the least change that you can make uh, in the features that you have to achieve the, your goal. So th that's my question, thanks. No, thanks for the super interesting question. And no, it's 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 definitely it's, it's you're definitely spot on with that observation. In in this release, we've not included any of the of the counterfactual explanations um, from that point of view. And I think I think they can make I think they can make um, interesting like interesting explanations. But I think at times also there can also be limitations with those. I mean, there's been enough publications showing that sometimes machine learning models can be very sensitive to small changes or to noise to flip these predictions. I think also, and this maybe relates to one of the other questions somebody asks about different methods and their underlying assumptions, pros and cons. I think, I think we wanted to include at least in this initial release almost the the some of the more simple and more well known explainability methods, such that hopefully the users as well are slightly more familiar with them, or they're maybe more easy, more easily kind of easier to get into than maybe things like counterfactual explanations. But I think that's a great. That's a great suggestion, and I think they can be super valuable. And so I think it's definitely something we should we should look at for future versions as as we hopefully expand this tool in the future. Thank you. Um, the next question I wanted to take, I think, is for is from Colin Colin McLean. I think you had a question for Tom. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm just getting the. No worries, no worries. Yeah, sorry. So I mean, it's um, yeah, it was a question about the study. Um, just obviously within your data set, you have um three features which are quite highly important, and you can see they're important. I was just wondering, did you perform the study again, but remove those three features to see kind of what other features were kind of cropping up as being important um, indicators? We didn't, but it's actually it's a, it's a nice idea. Um, one of the reasons we, why uh, we didn't is is quite um, may seem a bit crude, but from a clinical perspective, if we don't have those three variables, no one will use the model. So I appreciate that it would have helped us to potentially find additional variables. But once we got to the point of finding that we didn't really need to add much, that was our kind of main main goal. Um, if anything. One of the things that we found as a result of all of this is that um, there's lots and lots of work looking at things like biomarkers. People are really interested in things like biomarkers. But actually, what we've kind of shown with this is that your biomarker is going to have to be really very, very good to make any difference, given the costs of adding in a biomarker. So I, I actually, yeah, it would have been a very interesting thing to do, the, the, what you've suggested. Um, but no, that wasn't the original approach. Oh, OK, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. So I think we've got time for one final quick question. And the question um, we're gonna take is from Maria that unfortunately I think says she's working in the library so she can't open her mic, but maybe I will read out her question, the question um, that she's asked, which is, is Cox model implemented inside autoprognosis allowing comparison with the selected ML models? I think this also echoed one of the other questions about um, autoprognosis compared to just something like XGBoost. And so yes, um, we have we've implemented kind of a wide array a wide array of methods, including Cox models, XGBoost. I think one of the benefits of automated machine learning frameworks in general, especially in this type of context, is if that model happens to be the best, most appropriate model for a given data set or task, 
the automated machine learning algorithm should find this and should and should discover this given it, given it, given enough compute and enough function evaluations. Obviously, given the same amount of compute, it might be possible to optimize one specific algorithm using all of that optimization power to a slightly higher predictive power or or performance, but in general, kind of all things being equal, one of the benefits of these kind of automated machine learning approaches is they enable you to search not only, let's say, a hyperparameter space, but also a function and model space as well. Um, for like to determine to determine which model is best for a given for a given data set. So I think that's the last question we can take online, but I think as a, as I've said, we're going to try and take um, as many as we can offline in the Slack chat and provide answers um, to those. So if you did post in Zoom, please do try and post your question in Slack um, and we'll and and I'll try and pop an answer either from myself or whoever it is um, whoever it is directed at. So very briefly, just to wrap up, um, the recording for today's session um, will be will be placed on YouTube soon. So if you have any colleagues or friends that missed the session, please do direct them there once it's online. And please do join us for our next session, our 23rd Inspiration Exchange, Inspiration Exchange session, which will take place on December 13th, our last session of the year. And as Mahela mentioned, will be on the emerging area of data-centric AI, um, which, will be a, which will be a super fascinating discussion. Um, otherwise, um, do sign up for the for email notifications about our sessions if you didn't already or refer your friends to do so and thank you once again to all of our to all of our speakers our guests Aditya Owen and Tom for joining us and thank you everybody enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week and goodbye